Good morning to you. Happy Father's Day. Way to go, braving the rain, going through the deluge, and being here. Uh, we, we appreciate that, and uh, it's just been a very, very cool day. I hope you got some barbecue. We got more stuff, snow cones afterwards. Uh, it, it's pretty amazing. When I think about Father's Day, um, I have to tell you that, that, you know, when I actually think about, the first thing that comes to my mind is dad jokes. Dad jokes. Um, and, and I have to admit it, as a father, I love dad jokes, stuff like, what did the pirate say on his 80th birthday? I'm 80. Uh, and, uh, and then, I oh, know, I mean, that's good. And then, and then, um, and then um, like, this is kind of a good one. Uh, what, uh, what, what do you say to somebody who's trying to act like a noodle? You go, you're an impasta. Uh, or, uh, or my favorite one is, uh, wh- uh, what do you call cheese that doesn't belong to you? Nacho cheese. Uh, but uh, yeah, this is pretty good. How many of you, all right, let me just ask you a quick question. How many of you dads here this morning uh, are, are, are kind of known for your dad jokes? Let me see a show of hands. How many of you are pretty, the dads, you're funny, you're funny. Like, I mean, it's none of this, you know, and, and, and here's the, the, the if, if you raise your hand, I'm gonna invite you to come up here and, and pull my finger. No, that's not you. No, but, uh, but uh, no, you, 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 no, you, th- you, like, I don't know if you ever did this where you're kind of looking at your family thinking to yourself, you know what? I am so stinking funny. I wish I was them so I could have me as a dad. You know, you, you just kind of think. And, and I got to tell you, I, this is one thing, and I'm, I'm not boasting here, but I have to say this is one element of fatherhood that I took very, very seriously uh, with my kids. I, 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 I was not good at PTA. I can literally remember dozing off a couple of times in the meeting, my wife uh, nudging me and said, you are doing the prayer. And, uh, and, then, uh, and then stuff like uh, math, I was a horrible math tutor. I'm still amazed when our children can count out change. And, and then my worst thing was, um, I actually wanted to teach them shop craft because my dad was just unbelievable at that. I was awful. I literally, I literally screwed a birdhouse to the workbench. Um, and, and you're laughing. We almost never got that workbench in the tree. But, uh, but I, I just was not good at this stuff. Although, uh, I, and, and when I did, when I did uh, my dad humor, it wasn't just basic stuff. Like I, I, really, uh, I really had sort of an edge. Like uh, one, of my, one of my gags was when um, the girls, their, their, their rooms were just really messy. And I kept kind of joking about how this is a toxic waste dump, you know. And, and look at this stuff. There's fungus growing on the wall. And, and so I remember the day I walked in there, I actually took a pair of underwear and pulled it over my head and look through the legs so it would look like a hazmat suit and uh and and uh, yeah they're they're still in therapy but but uh but uh, yeah that that was and you know what's funny about that is i didn't realize that was not a normal like i thought a lot of dads did that gag a few years ago i was speaking at a men's retreat and I actually just in passing mentioned this as an illustration. I, you know, all these men there, have you ever done that thing where you pull your underwear over your head and you look through the legs like it's a hazmat suit? And they're going, no, we have not. And we are gravely concerned about your welfare. But yeah, uh, but, but uh, uh, I, I, just, I just think dad jokes are awesome. And yet it's odd, you know, I think about my own dad, um, I don't think so much about his sense of humor. He had a really good, he had a really good sense of humor. When I think about my own dad, when I think about my own childhood, what I most think about is that my dad really had a sense of adventure. He had a sense of adventure. And I'm not mean like he was trying to do anything crazy. He was like, okay, kids, this year, Labor Day at Baghdad. Uh, you know, or uh, he didn't, uh, you know, like we didn't vacation with Bear Gorillas. So he didn't take us to, you know, kind of wild, uncivilized places, you know, like Austin. Uh, you, you know the, that, uh, the, the, that my dad, though he was he was always kind of pushing us out in, into new experiences, and I can still remember my dad and I were in Indian guides. Do we have any Indian guides here? We did this through the YMCA. Uh, my name was Shooting Star. My dad was Falling Star, uh, and I remember camping up on top of Mount Mitchell, highest peak east of the Mississippi, six thousand six hundred eighty-four feet high, and waking up the next morning there was snow on the ground. Uh, I can remember one time our little tent, all of my family huddled together in this tent, and the wind just about blew our tent into the Gulf of Mexico. We 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 thought it was a hurricane, just a bad storm, but it blew in there at our camp site of Bahia Honda State Park in the Florida Keys, and it was just an amazing 
scary memory. I'll never forget. Dad took us caving and the gym hunting at this place called uh, Little Pine Garnet Mine up in uh, Marshall, North Carolina, in the mountains near Asheville. Uh, it was just a, it was a it was just a great thing. And and he didn't just talk about adventure. He he invited us to live. And I've often thought. I mean, this may be crazy, but I often thought that maybe that's ultimately what kind of opened me up later uh, in my first year of college at the University of North Carolina to, to kind of actually think about my relationship with God because through him I began to understand that, that in Jesus I was being invited. My father in heaven was inviting me through Christ to experience this, this amazing adventure, this grand story. This, I was being led by love and animated by God's grace to, to explore this new life of faith. I've come to actually think this is one of the greatest, most stunning elements of a life with God our Father in heaven is that he's not just a deliverer. He's a rescuer, he's a deliverer, but he's more than that. He's an adventurer. He's an adventurer. He calls us not to just not to just kind of experience life, but to experience a wholer life. What he describes in John chapter ten as an abundant life. Uh, I, I I think that is what's so stunning about this notion of God as the adventurer. Um, if you have a Bible this morning, I want to invite you to turn with me to Joshua chapter one, the very first chapter of the book of Joshua. And in fact, if you don't have a Bible, don't even worry. We're going to put these verses up on the screen. Uh, just two verses, Joshua chapter 1, verse 7, Joshua chapter 1, verse 9. And I'm going to invite you to read it out loud with me. We'll put it there on the screen. Let me just set the stage while you're trying to find this passage, if you're looking it up. Um, Joshua chapter 1, the people of Israel, along with Joshua, are, are on a, a, a full-on adventure. You remember the story that Yahweh, the God of Israel, the Lord God of Israel, their Father in heaven, uh, has delivered them out of Egypt, out from under the hand of a Pharaoh, out of the slavery that has, has really been their lot for like 400 years. But now, but now God's calling them to a new journey. There's kind of this new adventure, a new challenge. God is calling them to this new place, a place of promise. You remember this? He describes it as a land flowing with milk and honey. It's as if he wants them to understand, look, look, the life of faith is not just what you've left behind. It's not just what you've left behind. It's about a life beyond. It's about, it's about not just kind of looking backward. It's about moving forward. And he puts this in very, very vivid terms in these two verses. Joshua chapter one. Let's begin reading with verse seven. Let's read it together out loud. Let's read. Only be strong and very courageous, everybody. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. The Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. What does it look like? What does it look like to live with this God of adventure? What does it look like on this Father's Day to consider a God, our Father in heaven, who's not just a deliverer, he is that, but he's also an adventurer. What does that mean? When you look at this passage of scripture, these two short verses we've read this morning, first and foremost, what you begin to understand is when we think about God as a God of adventure, it is that God is a God who will, in fact, often call us to jump. But when he calls us to jump, he will always catch us. He might call you to jump, but he's always going to be there to catch you. Several years ago now, my daughter, just little girls, I was speaking at this camp out in Colorado, a beautiful place called Silver Cliff Ranch. It's right on the front range of the Rockies. And, um, and, and, and uh, they has, as so many camps do, they had at this camp uh, a magnificent ropes course. Um, and I suspect most of you know what a ropes course is. It's kind of a high altitude uh, obstacle course, right? And you've got these cables and webbing and, and you walk across a tightrope and you kind of crawl across a net and, and all this is strung out at the very, very top of these lodgepole pine trees. It probably shoot up uh, almost twice again as high as the highest part of the seal. And they're way up there. And, and it, it's very, very scary, very, very fun. Well, um, I noticed as I was watching the kids that week at the camp that there was one part of the ropes course almost nobody did. 
just, just uniformly, everyone wanted to avoid this part of the course. You could actually descend the course at three different points. And everybody came down before they got to this point. And what it was, was uh, you go up on top of this lodgepole pine tree, just shoot straight up. There's a little kind of a ladder deal. You go to the very top of it. When you got to the very top of it, there's a platform about the size of this music stand. And then what you're supposed to do is climb up, get on top of the music stand, and then about five feet out, there's a trapeze. And all you have to do is jump and grab it. Right? Piece of cake. And if you miss, piece of pancake. And, uh, and, and as I was watching it all week long, I was intrigued how the kids, the kids were to a person ignoring this leap. And I'll tell you one of the reasons why that, that, that intrigued me is because this was a middle school camp. Do we have any middle school people here this morning? Raise your hand for your middle school. Yeah, okay. So, so let me just tell you something I've learned over the years. I love middle school people, but one thing I've learned about middle school males, middle school boys, oh my gosh. Anyway, middle school males is that if a middle school male will not attempt something, you can be almost certain it is lethal because they don't realize their bodies are breakable. You go, who wants to skateboard off the balcony of the church? Dude, you know, uh, know, who wants to be dragged behind the back of a church bus? Dude, you know, I mean, there's actually a book uh, called Would You Rather, where you have all these choices and you can just kind of throw them out. And one of the choices in the book is, would you rather be attacked by a a herd of pit bulls or fall into a pond of blood-sucking leeches? If you're a middle school male going, can we do both? I mean, they don't realize, they don't realize their bodies break. And these middle school guys, they wouldn't even make the leap. And I was trying to kind of get them to do it, right? Because I wanted to see if it was safe. And, and, and I kept saying, I said, I said, hey, let me see one of you middle school dudes try that. You know, it'll put hair on your chest. And they're going, really? And, 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 and they wouldn't do it. They said, no, Duffy, you do it. You're old, you're going to die soon anyway. Yeah. Talked a lot about hell that week. Anyway, it was the last day of the camp. And um, I announced to my family that their dad was going to make this leap. And my older daughter, Erin, said, that's stupid. And, 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 and be praying for Erin, because after she said that, Santa hasn't visited her. But, but then my wife, Maggie, said, I don't think the children should watch. So bolstered by these words of encouragement, uh, I, I looked at my little younger daughter, Katie, four years old, said, Katie, what about you? And she was awesome. I wish you could have seen her. Little four-year-old girl, she stood there like a rock. She said, Daddy, I'll stay. I'll stay. But if you die, can I have your hat? (laughs) So it saved us a lot of money. Neither kid has had Christmas. But but anyway, I I said, all right. So I started climbing up the tree. And and, 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 and if you've ever done this, you probably know kind of how it works. The the higher you get in the tree, the more you begin to realize that there is some movement in the tree. And it's not not a lot of movement. It's not like, you know, but enough where you're kind of getting higher and higher. And you're really going... (laughs) Uh uh-uh. uh. You realize, you know, like the trapeze is here and the platform is here, and it'll be difficult to make that turn. And so I began to contemplate what will happen if it, if it doesn't go. Like, well, what happens if I miss the trapeze? How will, how will uh, Aaron and Katie explain to the little friends, you know, when their friends say, well, What happened to your daddy? Why didn't he have a head? And, uh, or, or uh, you know, uh, like our Christmas picture, my wife holding me, you know, and, and all of these uh, thoughts begin to go through my mind. But if you've ever done something like this, you know there's a point at which you simply, if you're going to do it, you must leap, you must jump. And that's exactly what I did. I mean, I stood there, closed my eyes, opened them, and, and, and then I just, I just leapt out into air and, and just kind of just lunged for the trapeze. And of course, it's slow motion, right? And I'm up there swinging, and, and it's great. And my daughter came to dad, your pants are all wet. And, 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 but, but this was the kicker. The guy down below that sort of runs the rope course, he goes, great job. Let go. No. He wanted me to let go. He wanted me to let go. I said, no, you lower me. You, I made him lower the entire apparatus down 
out of the tree. He said, you didn't have to worry. We have you on a safety line. You don't just jump. I said, I know. He said, you wouldn't have fallen more than 10 feet. I, 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 can you visualize this body free falling 10 feet? coming to a dead stop at the end of a cable. You know, uh, I said, Daddy, Katie, look out. Daddy's legs are coming at your head. And, and, uh, and uh, I said, no. But this was the kicker. After all of that, I looked at the guy. I looked at Katie, and I said, um, can I do that again? Can I do that? Katie's like, give me the hat. But, but, the, but there's something about a moment like that. There's a piece of life that you taste in a moment like that that most of us never taste. You know why? Because we are afraid of adventure, real adventure. You see, we've been, we've been told by the culture to shrink our sense of adventure down to something that'll fit in a shopping mall. We've been told that our ventures are, are, are just kind of imaginary little puny little dreams. What I love about this passage of scripture is God is saying to the people of Israel, look, I'm calling you to a big dream. I'm calling you to a huge adventure. It is scary. But if you jump, I'll catch you. I will catch you. I, I love those words that, that, that we hear the Lord say, be strong and courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded. Do not turn from it to the right hand or the left that you may have good success wherever you go. I don't know this morning what your story is. But I suspect that especially there are some dads here today who perhaps are finding themselves at a place where it maybe seems kind of, kind of scary. Maybe you're afraid about the future. Maybe you're concerned about finances. Maybe you're concerned about the welfare of your children. Maybe you're concerned about your marriage. Maybe you're concerned just about you and who you've become and who you are and the kind of goals you pursue. This is a God this morning who calls us to bigger dreams, bigger adventures, not just to deliver, but to call us to adventure. And I just want to say to you this morning, especially you dads, if you are finding yourself at the edge there wondering, can I pull this off? Could this really work? That God calls you to jump. He promises to catch you. Every dad in this place can probably remember that day when they stood there in the swimming pool, a little child shivering and shaking there on the side of the pool, wanting so very badly to jump, but so very scared about what might happen if they miss, if it doesn't go right. And the father said, trust me, trust me, jump. There's some of you today, right here in this room, Maybe you just came today because your kid's been in VBS all week or maybe you come every week or, yeah, I don't know. But you're wondering, can I really make this leap? Let me say, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know what's gonna happen. I don't know how it's gonna turn out, but here's what I know. If you jump, if you jump, God will catch you. But that's where the second the second observation is so important because it's stunning enough that this God who is our adventurer calls us to jump and promises to catch us. But even more profound, even more amazing, I think, is this truth, that this God, our Father, the Deliverer, not only calls us to jump and promises to catch us, he calls us to go and he promises to go with us. He promises to go with us. Look at those words God gives this assurance to Joshua there in verse nine. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. I will be with you wherever you go. I am with you wherever you go. Um, I think one of the hardest parts about parenthood for me, I've told you this before several years ago. Maybe, maybe you remember this. One of the hardest parts for me about fatherhood was teaching my older daughter, Erin, how to operate a motor vehicle. Um, when, when, um, you know, when I took driver's education classes growing up in Charlotte, North Carolina, we watched scary movies. Um, I don't know if that's been your experience, some of you. I don't know if they do that anymore, but I'm just, just blood-curdling, gruesome movies that I will not describe in front of the children. But, but essentially, it was just awful, just one collision after another. And they turn the lights on, say, okay, kids, class is over, happy motoring. And, uh, and you're just scared to put the car in gear. And I don't know what they watched in Aaron's driver's education class. 
I think it was maybe uh, Elma, Thelma and Louise. All I know is that when we got in the car, um, it was just a nightmare, just like foom, 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 objects flying past us. Then we get out of the driveway, and, uh, and it's just this just, just series of sharp turns and speed and abrupt stops. And, and, uh, and of course, she gets this from her mother. But, but I, 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 and I should also explain, I had a, there was one other complication um, that, that, that I had a policy of my girls that I actually adopted from my own father. Uh, and that is that I said, if you ever want to learn to drive the family car, you're going to have to learn to drive standard transmission. You're going to have to learn with a stick and a clutch. I said, anybody can drive automatic, but if you can drive a stick and a clutch, if you can drive standard transmission, you will always be able to get home to me. Now, two clutches later, I changed policies. Uh, I said, that's why God gave us Uber. But, but, uh, but um, at this point, I was committed. The problem was Erin uh, was not able to grasp the, uh, she's a very, very bright young woman, but was not able to grasp the delicate dialogue that takes place in a standard transmission automobile between the clutch and the accelerator, right? Like when one speaks, the other needs to listen and they can't talk at the same time. And, and so consequently, uh, a lot of times we sort of move forward from an intersection to just be a series of just punishing, uh, lurching blows to the head and upper body. And sometimes she'd look over at me, go, Daddy, how come when I'm driving you can't control your saliva? And I'd say, sweetheart, Daddy's being whiplashed into oblivion. And I should explain one other element of this is that I think one of the dynamic is that I, had, I grew up in a family with all boys. And, and as guys, it's simple. When you teach a guy to drive, you just give him instructions and they grunt and ignore you. And, and, and I thought it would be a similar dynamic teaching my girls to drive. First lesson, first day, first instruction, I realized this is not to be the case. All I can remember is I simply said to her, turn here. She goes, <laughs> and I said, I just said that it's the way you said it. And, and, and so from that point on, I'm like, oh my gosh, there's like such a truck, you so need to stop, OMG. I mean, everything, everything changes. There was one fun part of the lesson, I will say this, as a dad, I did enjoy, we would get back to the house and we would rehearse, you know, what have we learned today? And as an element of that uh, segment, we would talk about comments that were made during the lesson that were not funny at the time. But now with the ignition off, everybody's a little more lighthearted. And, and, and so it'd be, it'd be stuff like, uh, it'd be comments like, Dad, you know, why did you grab the steering wheel? Because honey, the woman wasn't moving quickly enough to avoid becoming your victim. Uh, or uh, my, my, my younger daughter, Katie, had a great line. She goes, Dad, I saw the tree. <laughs> I, I did too. I did too. It, it got bigger and bigger, didn't it? And, and, and now it's leaning against our windshield. Uh, I said, remember, the object is not to spot them, but miss them. Uh, in fact, we still, uh, the, our favorite line, we still laugh about this. We were talking about it at Christmas. My favorite line is this, Daddy, are you okay? Yes, sweetheart, don't worry. It's just a bloody nose. But, but these, driving, these driving lessons were hard. They were hard. I mean, those of you who are dads, you, maybe you've been through this, or moms, you know what I'm talking about. There was yelling, and there was pouting, and there was crying, um, you know, and, and, and she also got emotional. And, and I remember we'd get back to the house, and it would always be the same thing. We'd walk up the front porch, go through the front door, and my wife would greet us there. She'd meet us. And my daughter, of course, would just walk right past her, <laughs> just walk right past her, go straight upstairs. And we only have a one-story house. That's how you know. Holy cow, she's mad. And, and, and I never forget my wife then will always look at us. She would look at me and then say, don't forget why you're doing this. Don't forget why you are doing this. And I'm going, because you won't do this. But, but actually what she was saying was very profound. She was reminding me that there are some truths that you cannot communicate from a distance. 
that, that as a dad, if I really want my daughter to get this stuff, it's not enough just to kind of have her take classes on driver's education. It's not enough to say, honey, be sure you read the operator's manual from the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Uh, it, it's not a matter of saying, uh, sweetheart, instead of videos tonight, we're going to watch uh, several uh, decapitations. It's, it's, it's not, I can't just say, hey, hey, uh, here's the, you know, it's, it is certainly I'm not going to yell instructions from the side of the road, right? That, that's not safe over there. And, and, and so I realize, my wife realizes, if I really want her to get this stuff, I've got to be in the car with her. I've got to be right there next to her. That if I really want her to understand, because there's some truths that are too profound to communicate from a distance, what I love about this God, our Father, who calls us to adventure, is he doesn't just send us out. He goes with us. He goes with us. He says to Joshua and the people of Israel, I will be with you wherever you go. What that means, men and women, think about it this morning. Maybe you're dead, maybe you're a mom, maybe, maybe you have no children, maybe you're a teenager. What that means is this, that there's a God. There's a God who's in the car with you. There was a God who was on the journey with you. There was a God who'll be right there beside you. That's why we celebrate at Christmas this notion, the word became flesh. The word became flesh. That's why we call the Christmas season Advent because God came to be with us. And Advent is right at the heart of the adventure to which God calls us. He calls us to go out but he goes with us. And that means this morning, if you're stressed about your marriage or maybe you're thinking you're traveling this thing alone because you know, work things are stopped, they're really tough. And maybe you're you're worried about physical problems or maybe at school or maybe just among your friends, it just feels like you are on the journey alone. No, God is calling you to a big adventure, but he's not calling you alone. He is with us. He's with us. I don't know this morning what you think about when you think about your dad, but I think about my dad. One of the greatest gifts God gave me in my dad was he had the heart of an adventurer. In fact, if you look at the screen, that's, uh, that's actually me and my dad. Um, I'm the one on the left. That's one of our very first outings together. I was probably... Uh, I was probably about a month old at that time. Now, I know he doesn't look like an adventurer there. He doesn't look like a guy who's ready to explore, you know, vast new landscapes. But what I saw in my dad was a man who embraced a faithful, loving God and father. And he helped me to understand. He helped me to kind of come to terms, to be open to the idea that this God, my father in heaven, loved me as well. My dad died about five years ago. He's not here anymore, but his legacy is immense. And now, inspired by that, inspired by my own dad, I want to communicate that joy and that wonder and that adventure to my children and to my grandchildren, which is why I feel so deeply about what I want to say in these last few moments of our time this morning. Two things. The first is this. If you're here this morning and you're a dad, you're a father, um, and you're kind of feeling uncomfortable as I talk about these things, you're kind of beginning to wonder, you know what, I'm not sure I really can pull this off. I'm not really sure I've done a good job. You have your regrets. First of all, I get it. I get it. I don't think any parent, father or mom, any of us think we really got this thing nailed. I know myself, you know, I've been in youth ministry almost all my professional life, but I know even as a parent of teenagers, I would go to these like seminars on parenting and I'd hear sermons on fatherhood or whatever. And every time I heard one, I left discouraged. I felt like, you know what? I'm a loser. I'm a jerk. I'm a terrible father. On the way home, I'm going, honey, you know what? If we love the kids, Let's put them up for adoption. I mean, I just just felt like a total loser. And here's the bad news. You're right. You're right. None of us can be the fathers we want to be. None of us can because we don't have it in us. We are not capable of living this kind of adventure by ourselves. We're not gracious enough. We're not forgiving enough. We're not patient enough. We're not loving enough. We're not unselfish enough. All of us in this room understand that, which is why 
before we can ever begin to explore with our kids the journey of God, the adventurer, we, each of us, have to be released from the slavery of sin. We have to trust our hearts to God, the deliverer. The only way we can lead our kids into this grand adventure with Christ is to give ourselves to Christ. Give ourselves to the one the Bible describes as the pioneer. The pioneer, that's an adventure word. The pioneer and perfecter of our faith. That's Jesus. And what that means on this Father's Day morning is simply this. That if you're a dad here today, your most important relationship is not the relationship you have with your children. It's not even the relationship you have with your wife. Your most important relationship is the relationship you have as a child with your heavenly father. That's where the adventure begins to get big. That's where the story begins to be told. But there's one other point I wanna make, one other idea, and that's this. Maybe you're visiting this morning for the first time. Maybe you're here um, as a regular. Maybe, maybe you just came this morning. You don't even have kids. You just heard there's gonna be free barbecue. You know, <laughs> that's awesome. Here's what I want you to know. There's a God who invites you to jump. There's a God who invites you into this adventure. It doesn't matter what kind of bondage or slavery you're leaving behind. Just like God called the people of Israel, I wanna lead you forward. You can make that leap of faith, and I'm gonna tell you right now, I'm gonna promise you, God will catch you. He will lead you out, maybe to scary places that you've never imagined, but he will go with you. And that's why this God says to us, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened, do not be dismayed, for the Lord, your God, is with you wherever you go. Let's pray. Lord, I wanna pray this morning for the folks in this room, but especially for dads, especially for dads. Um, it is so easy to kind of shrink down our dreams and shrink down our hopes of adventure into something that's been domesticated, something that's been shaped by Madison Avenue or by our jobs or by our careers or by the media or whatever. But inside of us, you have planted a heart that is yearning for a bigger story, as are our children. Lord, we cannot begin to live that story. We cannot begin to live that adventure until we give our hearts to you. Help us this morning. Speak to some dad right now. Give him the courage to jump with the assurance to know that you'll catch him. Speak to some dad this morning and call him to this grand adventure with the promise that you will always be there with him. Thank you, Lord, that you have loved us deeply fully, and that you call us to this place of promise, this amazing adventure. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.